Thank you. I am joined by Evelyn, and Evelyn is our VP of Education, and we are going to be on the back end helping to watch for your questions and chat and uh, everything else that we need. And uh, so we're really excited to have you all with us today. And I'm especially excited to be welcoming our presenter for session number two uh, in, here in room one. And we have Margaret Harris. Okay, hopefully I don't mess it up. Schultz. Yeah, you got it. Got it. <laughs> practice, practice. We have Margaret Harris Schultz with us today. And Margaret is going to take us through her session called Turbocharge CS with Instructional Coaching. So I am going to stop there. Margaret, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'll go ahead and stop my share. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I guess depending on where in the country or the world you are, I'm so excited that so many of you have chosen to take time out of your Saturday afternoon to share with us today, because I'll be honest, it takes a lot for me to give up any of my weekends. So I just appreciate you joining us here today. And I'm really excited about this conference as a whole, and also to share a little bit with you all about what I'm passionate about, which is instructional coaching and how that can help us support instruction in all areas, including computer science. So again, my name is Margaret Harris Schultz. Um, I am on Twitter if you want to connect with me that way. I don't know how many folks are still on Twitter or how many people have like jumped ship at this point, but I'm still there for the time being. So if you would like to connect with me that way, feel free. I would love um, to engage with you on Twitter. But without further ado, we're just going to kind of jump right on in. I would love to know a little bit about who's in the room. So thank you to everyone who's introducing themselves in the chat and talking about where in the world they are located. I also would love to know what you do to support student learning. So what is your role? We have computer science teachers in the room, maybe some school administrators, maybe even some instructional coaches. Just let me know what it is that you do to support students. See a lot of computer science teachers, awesome. And high school math, wonderful. Awesome. Digital literacy teacher, wonderful. Keep them coming. Um, I wanna make sure that as I share with you, what I have to share today that I can try to make it as relevant to you as possible. I see a technology specialist, some STEM folks in the room. Amazing. Okay, eSports. Yes, shout out to eSports. <laughs> All right, perfect. Keep them coming. You won't distract me by blowing up the chat as I'm presenting. I am going to try to keep an eye on it. Um, there are some times during the presentation where I will stop and ask you to contribute some things in the chat. So I will be definitely checking on that. Again, my name is Margaret Harris Schultz. In my current role, I am the coordinator of educational technology for a school division. And so I, I do a couple of different things in that role. The big thing is I coordinate all the ed tech. It was pretty self-explanatory, right? Um, but when teachers want to use amazing platforms like Code HS, I'm one of the people who looks at those platforms to make sure that they're safe for our students, that they're protecting their privacy, and that they are really strong in supporting our instructional program. I also oversee our K-12 library media specialists and our K-12 instructional innovation coaches. And that is just a very fancy title for our instructional technology coaches, or you might have um, technology integration specialists, those folks, I lead that team as well. And then lastly, I am one of the people um, who support K through five computer science integration. And so in our school district, we take kind of a shared approach and we have folks who support K through five, another one who supports middle school and then folks who support high school as well. In my former life, I was a secondary teacher. I taught high school English for a number of years. I got my master's degree and became an instructional coach and then an instructional technology coach. And I have also taught virtually for as long as I've been teaching. So well before the pandemic, I was teaching over Microsoft Teams and Zoom and all the things. Um, so it's it's been a wild ride, <laughs> I will say that. 
<laughs> but that's a little bit about me. Um, one more thing is that I work for an organization that I did not put on the slide because I'm not here in that capacity right now, but I work for an organization called Cult of Pedagogy, which is run by the fabulous Jennifer Gonzalez. So if you um, would like to check her out, she's amazing for all things teaching and instruction and learning. But with all of that aside, I want to go ahead and dive right into our session for today. So I've got quite a lot to share with you. We probably won't cover it all. So I'm going to get some feedback from you so I know where we should spend our time. There is a QR code that you can see on your screen. And that QR code or the tiny URL at the bottom should take you to a wakelet. And that wakelet will have links to this presentation that you're seeing now. And then any other resources that I kind of allude to during the presentation should be linked there as well. And Cult of Pedagogy is also linked in that wakelet too. If you scroll in that first column, I believe there is a link to the Cult of Pedagogy website. I see that question in the chat. Okay, so what I would like for you to do for me is take a look at our session agenda on this screen. We have five different areas where we can spend some time. The first is partnering with an instructional coach. What might that look like? The second theme is how do we accelerate computer science instruction? The third is what are the actual coaching strategies we might encounter that can support high quality instruction? The fourth, is how might we advocate for coaching support if you don't have coaches in your school district or your organization? And then the last one is how to become an instructional coach if that is something that anyone is interested in. So what I would like for you to do is in the chat, just drop a number one through five about what you are most excited to learn from this presentation. And that will kind of be my gauge about where we spend our time. I see some threes coming in. A lot of twos and threes, it's right in the middle. <laughs> That's where we're gonna spend the bulk of our time, it looks like. Okay, perfect. All right, well, let's jump into it then. Before we get started in the content, I, we're gonna play a quick little game. Now, if you have ever been a teenage girl, you probably recognize this game. If you've not ever been a teenage girl, you'll pick it up really quickly, I promise. The game is called Never Have I Ever. It's a little bit of a spinoff, so don't get too worried. Here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna start with all five fingers up like this. And I'm going to read a statement that starts with the Never Have I Ever. And if you have done that thing before, you're gonna put a finger down. So each time I read the statement, if you've done whatever I'm saying, you're going to put a finger down. And then at the end, we'll see how many fingers folks are left with. All right. So five fingers up. I'm going to trust and believe that you're doing it because I can't see anyone. OK, <laughs> never have I ever learned a great teaching strategy at a conference and then never actually implemented it. So went to ISTE, went to something amazing never did the thing that I meant to do. All right, next one. Never have I ever gotten really excited about a project idea and then immediately got overwhelmed by the thought of planning that project. Really excited about the idea and then whoosh, that seems like a lot of work. Okay. Next, never have I ever Wished I had an extra set of hands during a lesson. Or if you wish that you could clone yourself during a lesson, like you need to be in multiple places at once. Yep. Okay. Never have I ever refrained from asking for help because I didn't want it to reflect poorly on my eval. Knew I was struggling, but didn't want people to know that I was struggling. And then last one, never have I ever felt like I could be a better teacher if I just had more time. So if you're feeling brave, you can share your final number in the chat. How many fingers were you left with? 
if you're feeling brave, you can share that. If you're not feeling brave today, that's okay. You don't have to share. I see a lot of ones coming in. I was a one when I did this myself, some twos and threes. Yeah. So these are issues that most of us have encountered, right? A lot of these things we've been struggling with as teachers or as coaches or as administrators. The good news is partnering with an instructional coach can help with a lot of those things. I'm just gonna quickly share with you a couple of different ways that could look, and then we will jump into some of the areas where you guys wanted to focus. So I think it's good to start us off just to kind of calibrate with a definition of what even is an instructional coach? What do those people do? The definition that you see on your screen is from Jim Knight from the Instructional Coaching Group. And I am gonna read it out loud for those of us who benefit from hearing it. Instructional coaches, partner with teachers to help them improve teaching and learning so that students are more successful. To do this, coaches collaborate with teachers to get a clear picture of their current reality, to identify goals, to pick teaching strategies to meet those goals, to monitor progress and problem solve until the goals are met. To put it simply, Instructional coaching makes it easier for teachers to meet the needs of their students. And I love this definition because I think it really sums up in a nutshell what the goal is. If you have coaches in your district or in your school division, um, you might already know that there is a wide range of functions that they support. And so different coaches in different areas around the world and around the country will do different things. But the bottom line is coaches are here to make it easier for teachers to do their job, which is meeting the needs of your students. So what can happen during a coaching partnership? A lot of different things, like I mentioned, but here's some very quick examples. So you can have an idea if you've never worked with a coach before or if you have, but you're looking to push that relationship a little bit more. The first thing that could happen is a non-evaluative observation. I hope you're not triggered by that word observation, but in my experience as a teacher, an observation was when a principal or an assistant principal came in to watch me teach, then they gave me feedback. Sometimes it was not very kind feedback. It was just, you need to fix this, this, and this, and there was no support on how to fix it. That's not the type of observation I'm talking about here. Instructional coaches can actually come in just to collect data to help you improve, right? So for instance, let's say I am teaching a particularly difficult coding concept to my students, and I am worried that I'm not giving equal support to everyone who's struggling. And I just want a person in there to watch who I speak to in the classroom the most. I want someone to literally track the data on who am I talking to, who's asking the questions, how is that dialogue unfolding in my class? And then that coach can just give you that data and let you come up with your own conclusions and your own action plan moving forward. They can also support you in developing, developing that action plan. But what they won't do is say, you're excluding all of your boys. You need to talk to your boys more. Right? They won't come with the, to you with a list of things that you're doing wrong and expect you to fix them. Another thing that an instructional coach could partner with you on is just reflecting or planning for a lesson or a unit. So I know we've all had that experience where you got really excited about a lesson, you got into it with your students, you thought it was going pretty well, and then at some point you realize, uh, we're not exactly where I thought we would be, but you're not really sure what went wrong. An instructional coach is a person who could help you kind of unpack that and figure out where things took a turn. Um, they can also help you plan for things. So let's say you find a really cool lesson idea on Twitter or on a Facebook group, but you're not quite sure how to make it come to life. An instructional coach is a person who could partner with you to do that as well. In the during the pandemic, um, one of the things that my coaches told me is that a lot of their support had shifted to curating resources or materials just because teachers didn't have the time or the bandwidth to do that. And that's totally valid. It's totally valid now, even though we're quote unquote out of the pandemic. Um, a lot of my STEM coaches spend time just prepping lesson materials 
for teachers. So if you have a really great idea, but you're like, I, I don't have time to set that up, that's an extra set of hands for you to even set it up, to come and co-teach it with you, to reflect with you afterwards. And then the last example that I'll share with you is collaborative teaching. So all of you who put a finger down when, you, when I said if you never wished you had an extra set of hands, they can literally be your extra set of hands. Um, when I was actively instructional coaching with teachers, a lot of the time they would ask me to just be in the room when they tried a new technology because they were scared it was going to break. And I want to make sure somebody's there who knows how to fix it. <laughs> So that's one thing. Um, but also instructional coaches, all of the ones that I have ever worked with and all the ones that I have encountered as colleagues have been certified teachers. And so it's, it's another licensed certified teacher, an adult in your room who can help facilitate instruction. So really quickly, I'm going to take a pause and you can feel free to share in the chat. If we know that instructional coaching, the goal is to help teachers make their jobs easier, what might make it easier for you in your context to meet the needs of your students? Whether you have coaches in your district or not, think about your context and what would make it easier for you to meet the needs of your students. Yeah, more time to plan and prepare, definitely. More time and more materials. We're gonna talk about both of those things in just a second. Help with evaluation, effective communication, yeah. Oh, I love that, a way to assess what my students already know a way to assess their interests, someone to help you build like an interest inventory. Time to collaborate with coaches. Yeah, time is becoming a recurring theme here. Definitely. Feel free to keep it coming in the chat. But we're going to move on to how we can actually accelerate computer science instruction with the help of instructional coaches. This is a little bit of a case study. I'm going to talk to you about what we are doing specifically in our division, but there are a lot of different ways right, that you could accomplish this goal. I'm gonna kind of go through five different components of what we've done. The first is just looking at our implementation model. How do we teach computer science to students? Then we're gonna talk a little bit about funding, everybody's favorite topic. We will look into some partner organizations that might help. We'll talk about teacher training and time. And then we will talk about resources and materials. So first things first, you do not have to answer this in the chat unless you want to, but I think it's helpful to consider what do you know about your district's model or your state's model for teaching and learning computer science? I live and work in Virginia, and I'm very fortunate because Virginia has a pretty strong model for teaching and learning computer science. It's not the same across the board. Different states have different visions. So specifically in Virginia, um, we have computer science standards, number one. Like if you go to our Department of Education website, we specifically have standards for computer science. That is step one. In our school division, we kind of take an integrated approach and also an elective approach. So I mentioned that I am over K through five and our model for K through five students is that computer science concepts are integrated into their instruction across content areas. We also have maker spaces in all of our K through five schools, which is another hub for integrating computer science concepts. For our middle school, our six through eight students, we integrate it in their content areas, but they also have the option to take elective courses. So if they are strongly interested in computer science concepts, they can opt to take additional courses that are just about computer science. And we also have maker spaces in all of our middle schools. And then lastly, for our high school students, we have more of an elective model. We also have career and workplace readiness staff. So we have career coaches who support students in finding careers that are aligned with computer science, if that's something they're interested in. And we don't specifically have maker spaces at the high school level. We have what's called a learning commons. So we are actually in the process of taking all of our high school libraries 
and renovating them to become a learning common space, which includes a maker space in addition to all the other things you would find in a library. The other thing that we have done in our school division that has had a really big impact is we are writing our computer science standards into our local curriculum. So that means as we rewrite our curriculum, for instance, we're currently rewriting sixth grade English. As we do that work, we're going through and aligning the sixth grade English concepts to the computer science standards. So when a teacher comes to our division who's brand new and they get that curriculum framework, they don't have to wonder, how am I supposed to integrate computer science? I'm an English teacher. It's already there laid out for them. And then the last wonderful thing that I think Virginia has done is we have a state-specific um, open educational resource repository. It's a website called Go Open VA, and it's a place where they can um, allow folks to create lessons and unit plans to share widely across the state with all educators for free. Um, it's a wonderful resource, and they have focused strongly on um, boosting computer science implementation as well. So that's kind of the framework that we're operating in in Virginia. So as I, I go through the other pieces, if you're wondering, oh, how did they get there? We do have a pretty strong framework to build off of. This is just kind of a screenshot of Go Open VA. I'm not gonna take you into it live because if you're not a Virginia educator, you don't have access. Uh, but I do want to call to your attention, this is kind of our, our collections, our hubs of resources. And if you just look at that first line of five or so resources, you see that three of them are about computer science. Look, this is a really strong resource for our computer science teachers and anyone who's interested in integrating those concepts. So I want to pause for another moment and this you can share in the chat if you like. If you had an unlimited funding stream, if you had all the money in the world, what would computer science look like in your classroom? If funding was not an issue, you had an unlimited stream of money, what would it look like in your classroom? Better headphones, I love it. <laughs> Interactive, yes. Better tools, coaches, standardized assessments, include physical computing. Yeah, software and hardware, definitely unlimited equipment, a teacher assistant, that would be delightful, a smaller student to teacher ratio. Awesome, keep them coming. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about a uh, opportunity that our school division pursued. We actually applied for a grant to support computer science implementation in our school district. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing with that money. Um, the grant is called the Advancing Computer Science Education Grant. And the first thing that we've done is we've recruited several teacher cohorts who are folks who have volunteered to focus specifically on computer science integration. So with this grant money, we are able to compensate these teachers for integrating computer science into their instruction. We're able to provide training that is specific to teachers and also training specific to our coaches. We also have funding to create resources, lessons, videos, and also to purchase hardware and software. And then lastly, we are supporting this cultivation of kind of a professional learning community of people across our school division who are all interested in accelerating computer science. Another thing that we've done through that computer science grant is we've thought about what organizations in our local community might have a stake in computer science education for our students. And so not only like workplaces and the businesses in the area, but we also have some um, educational partners in the state who are very invested in supporting computer science for our teachers. So in the state of Virginia, we partner with an organization called Code VA. And their mission is specifically to make computer science education accessible to all kids in Virginia. It doesn't matter what school you go to. It doesn't matter what your zip code is. It doesn't matter your, your background, your culture. 
And one of the ways that they do this that we've been able to take advantage of is providing free and flexible professional learning options for all Virginia educators. I will tell you that their professional learning is also available to educators outside of Virginia, but I do think there's a small fee. Um, but it is free for anyone within the state of Virginia. So I'm taking you live into the website right now, but it is also linked in the wakelet. I see that question in the chat. There's a link to Code VA in the wakelet, but also I'm looking at that screen live right now because one of the things that I want to show you is they have a professional learning suite. And they change them every so often. And so I'm looking for the current ones. Here we go. What I wanted to show you is that they have specific professional learning opportunities for different levels. And they have one that is not live right now. It doesn't look like, but they have one specifically for instructional coaches is the one that I'm looking for. And so they will actually train instructional coaches specifically on how to support computer science instruction, which I think is amazing. Okay, shifting a little bit, I want you to think about your own context and try to think about when a professional development session or training that you've been to has actually made its way into your classroom. When we did the Never Have I Ever game, a lot of people said, yeah, I've learned this great thing at a conference and I never did it. Think about the times you actually did the thing. What happened? during that PD or during that training or after it to make it so that you were able to put the thing into practice. So you can share that in the chat if you like. I know it's a lot to unpack. So if you're not ready to share it in the chat just yet, that is totally fine. It was something relevant that you needed, definitely. Plan during the summer so you didn't have to do all the other things that you're doing during the school year to get that planning done. Yeah, time that keeps coming up. Awesome. A reliable tool relevant to the curriculum. Yeah, so all of these things are things I've heard from our teachers as well. So, what we've done through our grant, through our cohort, is we've created unencumbered time for our teachers just to build computer science knowledge and confidence. So we've paid for our substitute teachers um, to give them release time from their normal duties, just to collaborate with each other as a cohort to either learn more about computer science concepts, to create lesson plans, to create unit plans, and things like that. We also have division level and school level coaching support for those cohort members. So they have a coach who, when they go back to their classroom and they're ready to implement these things, they have a person alongside them who's had the same training and who can help them in that endeavor. And then the last thing is we've tried to set really manageable implementation goals. We're not trying to like change the world overnight, right? We're, we're working one lesson at a time, one unit plan at a time in hopes that we can start small and then scale these changes. Another thing that we try to consider is what might we include in a one-stop shop for teaching computer science? Um, because one of the things that we're facing in our division is we have pockets of teachers who are excited about computer science. Either they teach it as their content or they're interested in integrating it into the main content that they teach. But then we have other teachers who just, I mean, it's one more thing. So what we've tried to consider is how can we make it easy for people who don't need one more thing to be able to give their students access to computer science. And so we're kind of creating a video lesson repository. And this is just an example. This isn't the live web page um, because it's something that we're in the process of constructing right now. But essentially it will have a quick video for teachers to explain how to integrate a concept. It will have a, a description of the lesson, the standards alignment, it will have resources that you can download so that teachers don't have to spend a lot of their time, which we keep talking about, doing the heavy lifting of the planning. 
Okay, I'm keeping an eye on my time and I know that you guys wanted to spend um, the bulk of the time on accelerating computer science and this next section, um, coaching strategies. Because we're in a webinar format, this is not gonna be as interactive as it could have been. So if you have an instructional coach in your district or one that you work with, and you want to take one of these strategies back to them and say, hey, can we try this? I think that would be a great idea. But for today, I'm just going to kind of talk you through what they are and um, how they might help in your role. So first of all, coaching strategies, there's quite a wide array of them. And so depending on who you're partnering with, you might get uh, a different things in your coaching cycle. Some of the things that are pretty common are one-on-one -on -one conversations, right? Small group protocols. So they'll come into a department meeting or a professional learning community. Co-planning sessions, data collection tools, um, micro-modeling. So they'll come in and demonstrate a lesson for you, or they will uh, teach your students how to use a new technology tool before you roll it out. But then we also have a wide variety of protocols that I absolutely love. Um, and a really masterful co coach is going to be able to find a protocol to match with your specific need. So one of the examples that I have for you, and this is linked in the wakelet as well, is called the five whys. If you're familiar with that, I would love for you to drop it in the chat if you've done it before. Um, but it is a simple protocol. It, basically, the gist of it is you ask yourself why five times. The purpose is to find the root of a problem or to clarify a goal for yourself. So for instance, you would start with a statement like, my students are getting really frustrated when I assign them longer projects. Like they're fine when I do a lesson that takes a day, but when I assign them a project that's gonna take a week, they get frustrated, they give up. And so the coach is gonna ask you why. Why are your students getting frustrated during longer projects? And you'll try to unpack that and you might say something like, well, you know, they're really not used to having, do, having to do projects of that length in their other classrooms. Typically they'll just, you know, work on something at home and turn it in, but they're really not having to struggle with concepts in class like they do in my class. And so the next question will be, well, why? <laughs> why aren't they doing those in those other classes? You'll ask yourself why on and on and on until you ideally get to the root of the problem. If you have a group of colleagues or group of friends, it's really cool to all start with the same problem, do the protocol separately and see where you end up because it's never the same place. Another protocol that I've found really helpful that I've done with instructional coaching before is called the futures protocol. And so this kind of allows you to imagine the future that you want to see for yourself in your classroom context, and then come up with a really specific action plan for getting there. So for instance, you might imagine your class in June or May or whenever the school year ends for you and write down, what are my students doing at the end of a successful year? What are they saying? What are they feeling? And then also think about yourself as an instructor. How are you feeling at the end of a successful year? What types of things might you be doing and saying? The next step is you're gonna think about what your present context looks like from the vantage point of the future, which I know you're like, hmm, that's a lot, but you're gonna think about what your setting looked back way back in the present. So you'll say way back then, way back in April, right? My students were struggling to complete longer projects. I was getting frustrated because they were getting frustrated. I knew they needed more resources, but I didn't know where the resources were. I felt like I was always running out of time. And then next, you'll work with your instructional coach to map out what steps you took to get from the present to the future that you've just envisioned. And ideally come up with an action plan so that you can move towards that vision that you've set for yourself. So again, both of those protocols are linked in the wakelet. So you can um, feel free to take those and download them if you do have a coach that you work with or if you just have a colleague who's feeling adventurous. I know we only have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna quickly talk about advocating for coaching support for the benefit of folks who do not have coaches 
And then I'm going to touch on becoming an instructional coach for anyone who is interested in that as well. So I have four suggestions for you very quickly for advocating for coaching support. The first one is just about leveraging the research. There is a lot of research and it's continuing to emerge about the impact of instructional coaching. It's a somewhat new position, I feel like, but the research goes back. This one is cited in this study is 2018, but it goes back to like uh, at least 2010 and probably before that. The link that I have here in the presentation and also in the wakelet is from, um, it's from the Annenberg School, but it, it came out during the pandemic when they were trying to figure out how do we recover from COVID. And so they decided to research all these different areas related to teaching and learning to figure out how do we help people recover in our schools. And they did a great research um, compilation about instructional coaching and how that can be benefit for teachers. So even just presenting the research to an administrator, or to a district level administrator, um, might help you advocate for coaching support. The other thing that I always found super useful, and I, I tend to be a little bit sneaky sometimes when I am um, trying to get what I want, I call it coaching up. But if I'm talking to a supervisor and I really think something is a good idea, the best thing you can do is anchor it in their idea. Right. So our district has a strategic plan and you can see it on the screen. But it says things about like creating shared sense of responsibility for our student outcomes. It says things like um, building strong learning environments that are shaped with respect and connectedness, building the capacity of our leaders and our teachers and our staff. Right. How many of these things might I be able to use to advocate for an instructional coach? A lot of them. So if you take a look at your strategic plan or your mission or vision of your school or your division, you'll probably find pieces that you can use to say like, hey, if we're really committed to building the capacity of our teachers, it seems logical to me that we might wanna invest in instructional coaches. The next thing I would suggest is to find your allies, right? Don't go at it alone. I know it might feel lonely sometimes, especially when you're struggling with a specific thing in your classroom, but I guarantee you there are other folks who are struggling as well. And even if you're not struggling, even if you just want a partner, uh, I know a lot of times, at least in our school division, we have like one computer science teacher in the building, maybe two if you're lucky. And so when everybody else is having department meetings or team meetings, your PLC, if you're lucky, is meeting through Zoom, right? So you can connect with those other people in the school building, but sometimes you're just on an island of one. So I would encourage you to connect with your allies, with people who also believe in what you're doing. And then another thing that you could do is look for success in peer coaching, right? If you don't have funding in your division or in your school to hire instructional coaches, um, one of the things that you can do is dip your toe into peer coaching. So serve as a coach for your colleagues, right? And so you can both support each other in collecting data about your lessons. So when you're on planning, maybe you duck into another teacher's classroom for 15 minutes and track who's asking the questions in her room. And then you can give that feedback to them and just say, hey, in the 15 minutes I was there, these are the people you spoke to. These are the kids who raised their hands. And then that at least gives them a starting point to try to make some evidence-based um, decisions. You can compare lesson plans, you can give each other feedback, uh, calibrate student work, things like that. There are things that you can do without an, a coach that are still coaching strategies. And then last but not least, if you are, are thinking like all oh, this is really appealing, I would love to actually get paid for doing that. If you are interested in becoming an instructional coach, I do have some quick insight for you as well. There are four things that I would suggest for you. Oh, I'm gonna go back for a second. The first thing is just to talk to other instructional coaches. I think it's really important that you get a clear picture of what that role is, what they actually do on a day-to-day -day basis, because it's not always glamorous. And I don't want you to go in with misconceptions. If you don't know any coaches, find them on Twitter, find them on Facebook, like they're out there. So talk to a person who does that. Um, the second thing you can do is look for teacher leadership opportunities. 
the next time the principal is looking to put someone on yet another committee, like, yeah, volunteer for that committee. See what it's all about. See how you can flex some of those skills. Because the most important skill in being an instructional coach, and I don't care who you ask, they should all give you the same answer, is building relationships. That is the only skill that really matters as an instructional coach, because everything is tied to the relationships that they have and the partnerships with their teachers. And then the last suggestion I would have for you is to just start curating a portfolio and not, not a portfolio of the things that you've accomplished, not like a resume, but a portfolio of the times that you've grown and reflected. So the times that you've failed and then you've adjusted and come back better. Because that is the other really strong component of instructional coaching is that growth and reflection component. If you don't have coaches in your division, but you're like, I actually, I need a person. I need someone to talk to. I have a couple of different links in the presentation and in the wakelet. I'm not going to go into each of them, but there are several organizations that specifically train computer science coaches. And the second link, CS Coaching for Equity, it's funded, I believe, by the National Science Foundation, and they will connect you with a coach, even if you don't have them locally in your division. And they will also um, accept ap applications for folks to become computer science coaches as well. So there's some options out there for you. All right, I think I'm just under my time to be able to invite a few questions. So I was trying to keep an eye on the chat, but there's a good chance I've missed something. So if there's anything in the chat or the q and I'm more than happy to address those things. It's like most people were using the chat, so. Okay. Looks like we have a presentation linked in there. I think we were having some good discussions happening. Awesome. So that's awesome. Sure, we can throw that link in again. We have a direct link to your slides. Well, I'll redirect to your slides. So I'll go ahead and toss that in. And I know okay. you have a link as well. Yeah. Let me see if I can go ahead and put the um the wakelet link in there as well. Perfect. That will have ton more resources. <laughs> Excellent. And you will all be getting uh, the resources uh, that Margaret has uh, shared along with the recording for this session in the follow-up. So we'll make sure that you uh, get everything that she has talked about today during her session. So yeah. And feel free to connect with me wherever you are. I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter. I don't really use Facebook anymore, um, but you can find me. <laughs> That sounds great. I will definitely be connecting with you as well. So this was awesome. awesome. Thank you so very, very much for a wonderful session. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, looks like we had a lot of engagement, a lot of discussion. So I know that everybody enjoyed your session as well. So thank you so very much, Margaret, for presenting for us today. We appreciate it. Of course. You. Thank you so much for having me. Thank, thank you, Margaret. And I'm gonna go ahead and take over the share and I'm gonna show you all what's coming up next because we do have more learning on the horizon today. So we have coming up at 1 p.m. Central Time for session three, our last uh, session or last group of sessions for the conference today, right before the closing session. So we have a ton more uh, awesome sessions coming up. So if you stay here in the main room, you will be hanging out for Mix and Match, a preview of the Code HS Middle School catalog with our very own Evelyn Hunter. And that will be right here in the main room. Then in room two, we will have Teaching the Next Generation of Scientists Engage ES and Middle School Students in Coding Scientific Models from our own Lisa Kilper. And she will be in room two. And in room three, we have 
Anaya with Meet the 2023 Code HS Inspire Fellows. And Anaya is going to be with uh, her panel of all of the Inspire Fellows, the Code HS Inspire Fellows for this year. Uh, so that is happening in room three and fun with three through five elementary Code HS with Portia Morrell, and she will be in room four. So you have a ton to choose from, and you can view all of those uh, sessions and decide which one you might like to attend live um, by browsing out to codehs.com slash TC to view the agenda and access all of those links uh, for each of those sessions. So we have about 15 minutes. So you have another break before the next session starts. So you can go ahead and get up and stretch, grab some more coffee, grab a quick snack and come on back to your computer for session three. We will see you all very soon. 